Alright guys, how's it going? Since I am a huge collector of films and I'm constantly buying, I figured it's about time to be uh, showing them on a monthly basis. So I'm going to be showing off and reviewing the films that I've bought in, bought in, bought in February. And there's 29 titles to be shown this month. And this is going to be basically an opportunity for me to show what I've bought in the past month. So. Like I said, 29 titles right now. What's in the bag? Yes, I am a big supporter of The Beat Goes On in uh, south, south, Southern Ontario. <laughs> uh, if you're familiar with Southern Ontario, you might have shopped there and you might know where it is. But uh, yeah, not all of these I bought there, by the way, but uh, a good chunk of them I certainly did. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I just mentioned it uh, because it's uh, a store that I definitely support and... Um, have been to a lot so so starting off film number one the goonies i had never seen this before i bought it so this was a blind buy and i'm glad uh, they released it in 4k with a slip cover <clears throat> there's a lot of films actually that are being released on 4k that i have not seen before so i always find that a great opportunity especially if i find them for a good price um you know in their ultimate form or ultimate uh, release that they have currently so I'm glad I picked this up I did watch it and I really enjoyed it and it's totally worth the hype in my opinion here's another one that was totally worth the, the hype and uh, blind buy as well because I had never previously seen it VFW there is a review on this channel which you can check out uh, loved this film I think I gave it a four and a half stars out of five on Letterboxd if I'm not mistaken um, so much fun, uh, pure grindhouse feel. It feels like an old uh, drive-in film that you would see in the 70s or something like that. Um, the cast is amazing. They're all um, people that you recognize from grade B uh, grindhouse genre films, basically, like B-movie trash, really. <laughs> um, but yeah, the director did an amazing job on that one. Very good stuff. I think I got it for like 10 bucks too. Blind Buy, again, from Arrow Video, The Last Starfighter. I had never heard of this one until it came out, but uh, it only took one trailer to sell me. Um, it's basically about this kid who is really into this 80s video game, like arcade game, and it turns out that this video game is actually created to recruit somebody who beats the game to um, basically fight off this nemesis or enemy alien race in space, so this random kid who beats this uh, Starfighter game has to save the world from <laughs> aliens. It basically looks like a cheap version of a Star Trek episode, um, like a lost episode or something like that. The alien designs are ridiculous, um, like a poor man Star Wars or something like that. Um, it kind of gave me, not that I've seen this film before, but it gave me a few vibes of um, war games because of the like retro 80s arcade style video games that uh, that used to be popular, like your whole Space Invaders and stuff. Um, the first act of the film is basically loaded with that kind of stuff. So if you're into that, you'll be into uh, Last Starfighter for sure. Lucky, this is directed by um, David Lynch's son. I, no, somebody do, uh, related to David Lynch. John Carroll Lynch. Um, I'm not sure what relation uh, they what relationship they have. I didn't look it up really, but uh, this is Harry Dean Stanton's last film. He actually died only about two weeks after this uh, film was made, and this is a super indie film um, with a lot of heart, and it's pretty art house too. But uh, it basically follows this guy who they call Lucky, and he is like in his 80s or 90s or something like that and he has just never been taken from earth yet uh, he smokes like two packs a day he does exercise he does some yoga and stuff but um, he's basically just uh, ready to go uh, not suicidal or anything but just ready to go anytime he uh, wants to be taken but uh, he just uh, never seems to kick the bucket and it follows him around this small town and he's a loudmouth he uh, He's always, like, saying, like, really inappropriate shit. Um, 
he, he has a bunch of friends at the local bar that they, like there's a lot of dialogue in the film and uh, it's, it's really well done. Like I said, it's very independent and um, it's really good storytelling in my opinion. David Lynch actually makes an appearance as well as an actor. So I recommend that. Literally I found it for $4 American. Like three something American and I had to buy it. And it came with the slip, which I was not expecting the slip cover. But uh, it is a DVD. That's the only way it's released. They, they don't have a Blu-ray of this film. But uh, the fact that it came with a slip cover um, is pretty, uh, pretty neat. This one I wanted to get for Christmas, but I just couldn't afford it with the pile that I was already going to get. So I had to wait a little bit on this one. But this is still sealed and I am waiting to watch it and I'm going to watch it really soon. Come and see. I am very excited. Very excited to watch this. I'm actually um, a little disappointed that I didn't switch a different film to get this one instead at Christmas. And I'm actually still surprised that I haven't even seen it at all yet, but uh, I've heard nothing but great things. Apparently this is a Russian masterpiece uh, set in World War II, I believe. Uh, this was made in 1985 and it's by a Russian director called Ilham Klimov and um, they say this film represents war better than, well, I don't know if it's better than any film ever made, but it's, it's, they put it like in the most realistic, like top five or top three war films of all time. So, um, this film gets nothing but praise and it's from the Criterion Collection, so you can't go wrong. Um, I've been buying a lot from the Criterion Collection because you really can't be disappointed with that, um, that company. They just, uh, they love films and they, uh, they treat them the way they should be treated. So nothing but good things to say about Criterion as always. Bones. Seen the cover many times through the, the last like two decades, but never uh, seen the film actually. Should I say two decades? Yeah, two decades. So it came out in 2001, but uh, never seen it before. I mean... My parents were kind of weirdos. They never let me watch anything R-rated until I was like 14. Um, you know, it was pretty sad. But uh, yeah, Snoop Dogg's in here. I know nothing about this. I'm totally going to go into this one blind. There will be a review once I watch it. Um, I didn't even read like the synopsis on the back because this is just one of those films where it's a horror movie and it has Snoop Dogg in it. Uh, probably going to be, you know, on the cheese level and the cheese factor, but... I just want that one to be a complete surprise for me, and uh, I am looking forward to it. Here's another one that I haven't seen, but is an 80s classic masterpiece, Pumpkinhead, on this beautiful steelbook. Um, I pretty much have all the steelbooks from Scream Factory, except the ones that I have already bought with the slip. I don't really like to double dip on films a whole lot, but uh, being that I've never owned this one or seen it before, um, I definitely got the steelbook. Uh, of this or the steelbook edition of this film um i think i'm only missing one i think the only steelbook i don't have is the thing um because like i said i already owned the thing from scream factory with the slip cover which comes with all the special features already the only thing it doesn't have is the steelbook so i'm not going to just buy the steelbook for the steelbook but um other than that i have the entire collection uh here's a three pack Beverly Hills Cop. I had Beverly Hills Cop on DVD and uh, then I found this three pack for really cheap and I hadn't seen number two and three so this is going to make quite one hell of a triple feature and I'm looking forward to watching them all. I haven't revisited Beverly Hills Cop the original for a while so <clears throat> making it a triple feature is going to be quite fun. All right an Italian stallion. <laughs> Torso by Sergio Martino. I love giallo films and I love giallos loaded with horror. Um, if you know what giallo films, you know exactly what they are. If you do not know what giallo films, they're basically Italian murder mysteries. And uh, they were extremely popular in the 70s. Uh, a lot of them were filled with go uh, sorry horror as well. So usually they were horror themed, but some were just like the murder mysteries. Others had more gore, others had more horror. Um, this one definitely packs in the horror and uh, I've heard really really good things. 
Uh, the most famous director for Giallo's is Dario Argento, hands down. Um, but Sergio Martino is definitely on that tier of expertise um, when it comes to Giallo and when it comes to Italian horror. So that one I've never seen, and I am looking forward to it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> 1950s monster movies, okay? I will take any of them. I don't care how bad they are. I will take any of them. Bullets won't kill it. Flames can't hurt it. Nothing can stop it. Do, 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 the spider. I mean, you can't go wrong with that schlock. Like, how can you not have fun with a film that looks like this? This cover sells me. <laughs> like, you, oh, I just, I can't get enough of this 50s horror schlock. It's just incredible. They're some of the most incredible horror films ever made because they're so cheese-loaded. Like, you can't get better midnight movies. Midnight movies. The 1950s black and white monster movies. You just can't. This one, of course, I've seen already and is uh, pretty marvelous. This is Parasite and this is from the Criterion Collection. This one, unfortunately, came with a dent, which pissed me right off, but I already have a replacement coming in the mail because if I'm paying this kind of money for this kind of stuff, I expect it to be mint. So, there was a time where I just, I would keep it, but I think this is maybe like the fifth or sixth time that the, that I've received something damaged. There's actually another one in here that's damaged too, which I'll just pull out right now. Why not? I got the Total Recall uh, 4K, which they just released coming with the slipcover. And um, again, it came with damaged uh, corners over here. And I'm just like... You know what, I could just try and find a case myself or just keep it the way it is or put it on my shelf backwards or something like that instead of like that. But uh, I'm just like, you know what, <laughs> screw it. I'm not going to pay, like this was 40 some dollars. I'm not going to pay that and, and have it arrive like this. So I'm just like, you know what, I'm going to send them back, do the email thing. They, they replace them for free anyway. You just have to basically send these back, which they also give you the codes to, sh to send them back for free. So the only thing it's going to cost me is a walk to the post office, so whatever. Okay, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. I don't think much needs to be said about this one. It's a uh, stoner comedy. Let me tell you right now that I hate... There's two terms I hate. I hate the term sto uh, stoner comedy, and I hate the term chick flick. Okay. I don't know why it always pisses me off to hear one of those two things, but it does. I say stoner comedy because this is, uh, like, what people consider it, and when people hear stoner comedy, they know what people are talking about, but just the term, it's like, like, does that mean you have to be a pot smoker to enjoy the film? Like, there's there's lots of films that are stoner comedies. I'm, I don't, like, I'm not into weed. I drink. Um, so, like, would you call, like, friggin', uh, what's that movie? Would you, The Hangover or, um, Project X. Would you call Project X, like, a drinking movie or a drunk movie? I don't know. I, I, I'm ranting on that, but same with chick flicks. Like, what's a chick flick? Do you, like, do you have to be female to enjoy the film? Like, The Notebook is a great film. Um, but everybody calls it a chick flick. I think it's a really well done romance like I mean there's chick flicks that I hate anything by Nicholas Sparks anything that's you know served with a dollop of cheese um if you consider Twilight a chick flick I hate that one but um but there are you know romance films involving a man and a woman that everybody considers chick flicks but I just I don't know the terms bug me so there's my rant <laughs> Oh, speaking of chick flicks, is this a chick flick? Because I like it. I like Robert Pattinson's performance. Um, I mean, there's some corniness to it, but it's not overload. 
Um, Pierce Brosnan is amazing in it. There's what I would consider a pretty good twist at the end. Um, but yeah, man, it's it's a good dramatic romance. Or chick flick, if you will. <laughs> oh my goodness. Food porn, the movie. I've heard that one on YouTube quite a few times. Chef. Incredible film. This is a 5 out of 5 stars. Um, this is... This is arguably a, a perfect film. If you haven't seen Chef, it's one of the greatest indie films made. Um, it's by John Favreau. He's uh, he's big in Marvel movies. He directed a few uh, he directed a few Iron Mans, and um, he directed Elf. And now he's taking a little bit more personal with uh, with Chef. And uh, the story's great. The acting's great. It's just heartwarming. Um, don't watch Chef if you're hungry eat first, please, because <laughs> it's happened to me a couple times, more than once, where I watch this freaking movie, Hungry, and um, I just want to eat everything. You ever been grocery shopping hungry? Well, this film's the worst. Just saying. You'll be uh, skipping the dishes at least once throughout. Another 50s masterpiece. This one isn't really schlocky or cheesy. This is a little bit more grounded and uh, classic, if you, if you will. Uh, the Day the Earth Stood Still. Now there is a remake in it with, there is a remake available, a more modern one with Keanu Reeves. have not seen it. I'm open to seeing it, but I highly doubt that it's going to match the brilliance of this one. Um, when I bought it, I hadn't seen it, but I already saw it a couple weeks ago, I think. I uh, really enjoyed it. This is, uh, you know, glorious black and white. You're dealing with an alien coming to Earth to send a message, and uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it, it hits a lot of the tropes of the early 50s that you would expect from a 1950s sci-fi. Hatchet 2, following the original Hatchet, um, which is the only one I, current, I previously had, so now I have Hatchet 1 and 2. This one starts right off where the first one ended, and the third one starts right off where this one ends. And uh, don't have the third yet, but uh, we'll be getting it as soon as I find it for a decent price. All three. Are all three directed by Adam Green, or am I wrong on that? The first two are, anyway. I think the third one he wrote, but didn't direct. Um, I'm pretty sure, now that I think about it. Another sequel, Machete Kills. Machete. Machete Kills. Um, a lot of fun. This is as fun as the first one, in my opinion. A lot of people don't like it as much. Fair enough, but I think it's all equal parts. Amazing. Bigger cast. Danny Trejo's always a blast. Can't go wrong with, uh, with that kind of grindhouse cheese at all. That is Robert Rodriguez as well, right? Yep. Both by Robert Rodriguez. Super indie, super low budget film, Detention of the Dead. Kind of blends some um, Breakfast Club vibes with zombies. A um, bunch of kids are in detention and then zombies come. Okay. If a, if, if a film's description ends with and then zombies come, I'm sold. Okay. I like B zombie movies. I like high-budget zombie movies, low-budget zombie movies, anything zombies, for the most part. I mean, I'm not saying I've never seen a shitty zombie film, but for the most part, I like it all. All right. One that splits a lot of audiences in... Is this 2019 or was this 2020? This was 2019. The Irishman, Martin Scorsese's masterpiece, the three-and-a-half-hour-long film bringing back De Niro, Pacino, and uh, Pesci. Actually, Pacino wasn't in uh, a lot, or if any, Martin Scorsese films. I'm trying to backtrack. Definitely not in the big ones like Casino and Goodfellas. That's that's Pesci and that's uh, De Niro for you. But yeah, this this film and its cast is amazing. They, they did some revolutionary stuff with the de-aging. A lot of people didn't buy it, though. A lot of people found it kind of corny and cheesy and gimmicky, especially. But um, this one, I, I've only seen it once. It's a long-ass film. And uh, I can't say it hit the levels of Goodfellas and Casino. But um, 
I do have to watch it again and give it more of a more of like a reviewist or a, a reviewist um, watch kind of thing because the first time I watched it I watched it purely for entertainment and I kind of shut my brain off a little bit but uh, I loved it uh, from what I remember and I definitely want to watch it again like I said paying more attention to the details and uh, that's what special features are for another thing about Criterion loading them the F up with special features Another triple pack. This is three films by Takashi Miike, one of the most famous Japanese, I wouldn't say grade B, but like grindhouse violent um, Tarantino-esque films, you could say. I can't go as far as saying he's the Tarantino of Japan, but uh, he, he likes to go over the top with violence and gore and fighting and stuff like that. So this is three of his have not seen any of them, so this is going to be first time watches for me. Uh, Shinjuku, Triad Society, Rainy Dog, and Ley Lines. Not sure what Ley Lines means, but uh, I'm pumped. I am always sold with anything by Takashi Miike, and uh, I think it's Takashi Miike. That's how a lot of people pronounce it, or uh, Takashi Miike. Sometimes I say Takashi Miike, but I am not 100% sure. On the pronunciation, I just know I love his films, and he's uh, he's definitely got a vision that speaks to me. One from like 20 years ago that I remember watching, always finding cheesy and corny, but still liking a little bit, and Scream Factory just gave it the proper treatment, Ghost Ship, uh, from 2002, and uh, coming with the slipcover, of course, loaded with features, there's your original artwork. I remember having this DVD with the lenticular, making it like 3D. And uh, just watched it. This is the most recent one I watched, actually. Watched it today. And uh, so much fun. Brought back all the memories. Especially that opening scene with all the deaths. On the boat's, um, like, dance floor. For anybody who's seen it. <laughs> all the people dying at once. It's um, it's pretty crazy. I mean, obviously the, the gore and the CGI is outdated by far, but... Uh, Oh, here's one that uh, divided audiences in 2021. Tenet on 4K with slipcover. Now, I have seen this. I did like it. People are saying that this is the most confusing film that uh, Christopher Nolan has released in his career thus far. I don't think so. I still give that trophy to Interstellar. Uh, Interstellar is the most confusing film that Christopher Nolan has released in his career. Um, this one, if you, you know, sit down and really focus and pay attention to what's going on, it's not that hard to follow. I mean, the only thing you have to really watch for is what's going forward and what's going backwards. Um, but they really explain themselves with that uh, concept fairly well. Now, there is a lot of themes going on and different people's storylines that you do have to pay a little bit more attention to. I'm not going to say that I totally 100% understand this film because Christopher Nolan purposely <laughs> makes films as confusing as possible. He purposely makes films to watch multiple times, not just once. So that's one of the reasons I bought it actually is because I wanted to revisit it and I want to revisit it more than once. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely going to be doing that, and I want to be paying more attention to it and kind of piecing it together so I understand it fully. But is it his most confusing film? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, Interstellar, I've watched that multiple times. Way more confusing. Um, this is an art house independent film, which is actually mostly in French. Is it mostly in French? It's half and half at least. Um, this is The Woman in the Fifth. I blind bought this. Blind bought meaning never seen before. And uh, I watched it once. Uh, it confused me. I was slightly underwhelmed with what I thought it was going to be. But it does hold or it does merit lots of rewatch value. And um, 
It's a psychological thriller, very art house, like I said, um, about this man who he meets this woman, but he starts to question his own sanity and um, and whether you know she's actually there or not. There's some some murders that go on around the the town that he's living in. He's living in Paris, and. Uh, uh, Kristen Scott Thomas, right? Yes, Kristen Scott Thomas delivers a really, really good uh, performance. And there's a scene at the beginning, without spoiling anything, that you're watching, and it's like, what? Like, like, not confused, but it's a scene that kind of pissed me off anyway. Like, as soon as the film started, in the first five minutes, I'm already pissed off. I'm like, why are these people doing this? Like, what the hell's going on? I'm not saying anything violent or anything like that, but just annoying characters. And things, things that people do and say that make you question why they're doing that and saying it. But as the film goes on, especially when the third act rolls around, starts to explain why. And then I'm like, oh, you got me. You got me, movie. <laughs> um, but it was okay. I need, I need to watch it again to really um, kind of make a, a better opinion on it. Whether I loved it or, you know, liked it or whatnot. Um, okay. Another one where the title sells me. I had watched it already before I bought it, but uh, this is another one where I just have to see the title and the concept, and I'm sold already. Killer Sheep, okay? Killer Sheep. Black Sheep, unrated. This is a New Zealand film about Killer Sheep. <laughs> and um, you seriously get some inspiration from an American werewolf in London with the transformations from human to werewolf except this is human to sheep. And um, it's about an experiment gone wrong with um, with sheep in New Zealand. They were trying to make like super sheep kind of thing. And uh, one of the main characters has a sheep phobia. So that just plays into the humor so much more. And um, I mean, what better enemy than killer freaking sheep? It's great. Check out Black Sheep. You will not be disappointed if you want some cheesy B-movie schlock. Here's one I haven't seen yet. Night of the Creeps. Heard nothing but good things. Again, don't know the synopsis. This will be a first time watch and uh, going in blind knowing nothing about it. I love that. Um, I mean, I've seen like some poster art and like some clips here and there, but uh, I don't know the premise of the film. And I do know this part where they're shooting up a bunch of, a bunch of zombies or um, not exactly if they're technically, I'm not sure if they're technically zombies or if they're you know, on some spell or something like that. I don't know. And I don't want to know until I watch the film. But like I said, I've heard uh, great stuff on it. So I'm excited for it. Um, the next three, the last three actually, um, I have reviews up, so if you want to hear my thoughts on them a little bit more in detail, you can check those out. Uh, my Bloody Valentine Steelbook, that's another Screen Factory Steelbook that I picked up. Um, I did the review for it on Valentine's Day, this is from 1981, and I really did end up uh, enjoying this film. This is one of the best slashers from the 80s and pretty much ever made. It has a lot of the slasher tropes. A lot of people are not going to like it because of certain twists or certain um, explanations and stuff like that. But if you are a slasher film and you know how slashers work, this checks off all the boxes for what a slasher film is. So in that sense, if you can wind, if you can watch it without like the blinders or the expectations of what you want the film to be and you just watch it as what a slasher should be, I mean, it nails it. So that's all I've got. Uh, Tales from the Dark Side, again, I have a review for this. It was a little underwhelming for what I went into it expecting because I love anthologies. They're one of my favorite styles of film, period, but especially when you get an anthology horror, um, you know, I, they, like, I'm automatically sold. And uh, just from, like, the poster art and the cover and stuff like that, I'm expecting, you know, creep show level stuff, but it didn't really hit creep show quality to me. So, uh, still good. It's not a bad film at all, but uh, 
And then last but not least, one of the most recent reviews I put up. Uh, this is the latest Hammer horror film that I watched from the Hammer Productions line, Scream Factory again. Absolutely love this original artwork and um, great Hammer film. I was, I was not really into Hammer films until I would say the last year or so. Just never bothered with them. Uh, they never interested me. I always found them too... Like, there's certain genres that <clears throat> that I've started to become more of a fan of recently that I never used to like. Like, there's still some genres that I don't like at all. Like, I'm not big on uh, period pieces. I'm not big on westerns at all. But who's to say that one day I won't be? You know what I mean? Because I wasn't into... Hammer uh, films at one point, I would just find them boring, um, and the trailers would never intrigue me until I watched one or two and uh, and heard about one or two, especially the Draculas and the Frankenstein's. Dracula especially, and diving more into what the UK did with the classic monster series that Hollywood did with Universal Monsters, seeing Hammer Productions kind of go the same route but in their own way um, is very interesting. And because I've always loved gothic cinema there's not a lot of better done gothic cinema than hammer films like you they just they milk it with the with the scenery and the the cinematography and the, like the graveyard scenes and the castles and the music and the candle lighting and the candle wax like lanterns and all that it's just it's really gorgeous to look at and uh and uh it's just really good filmmaking and it captures a mood and um, an atmosphere, which is a lot that I look for in films. It's it's one thing that captivates me a lot is is a film's mood and a film's atmosphere. If it's well done, and if it can make me feel something, like not not emotionally, but like make me feel reminiscence to what's going on, or bring back memories, or bring back feelings of a time where I was somewhere, you know, like, those are the kind of films that captivate me a lot, but, uh, but yeah, that's what was in the bag for this month. 29 releases is a lot. I'm not always going to have this many films. Some months it might just be five. It really depends on what my budget is like, but, uh, there's definitely not going to be a month that passes by where I don't buy at least one film. So, um, yeah, March, uh, I'll be doing it pretty much usually the last day of the month, sometime around there. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun talking about uh, the stuff I picked up throughout the month. So uh, this is what's in the bag, son. <laughs> it's uh, it's going to be fun. I Like I said, I can talk about films for hours. So maybe I've shown you some that you've forgotten about. Maybe I've shown you some that you didn't think were released. Maybe you just like to listen to people talk about films on YouTube. That's what I like to do. I can literally listen to somebody talk about films for hours. So that's what I'm here doing myself. If you like it, subscribe to Morgan Film Fan. If you like hearing my voice or if you like my reviews. And uh, I will be back for more. So thanks for listening if you're still here. And until next time, cheers.